Amen, amen. I want to ask you just to take out your Bible. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Jeremiah 24 verse 7. Jeremiah 24 verse 7. Who's excited this morning? Anybody excited this morning? The Lord is good and He's faithful. And, and we are excited to have everyone here again the last couple of weeks as we've been preaching on being uh, committed to love. And I always love having children, you know, part of the ministry and part of the church in the services. I know that there have been times that the church was so full that the kids had to sit in front because we didn't have enough seats. But that's what church is supposed to be like. Amen. And I'm really excited once again to start with Children Church. Hopefully soon we can start again with all of that, with the regulations and the rules that we have to follow and everything that we need to do. And at the moment we can only accommodate 250. Um, I would love to see the church full every Sunday because we only have a certain amount of people that we can accommodate. But I'm glad you are here. Amen. But there's mother's rooms at the back that you can use that we have dedicated to the moms. We have a TV at the back as well. So if you need to sit at the back, you're welcome to do that and join in the service still uh, with us. Even if you have to sit in that area, we have, we have an air con, everything in there, so you'll be, you'll be okay. But I'm glad you are here. Who's glad to be here this morning? Everybody glad to be here? And uh, I'm, I'm also happy to see a lot of new faces. Can you just say welcome to them again? Just say welcome to all those that's here for the first time. Uh, we believe that anything that is rootless will always remain fruitless. Amen. So, so we have to have roots somewhere in order for us to have fruit. So I'm, I'm glad you are here this morning. I'm really excited to preach to you, to those who are here for the first time. Just to recap real quick, if you have been joining us via live stream, or maybe you saw us on Facebook, we have been preaching lately on being committed. Uh, in the beginning, we spoke about being committed to uh, family, to the kingdom of God, to His presence. And this last quarter, we are preaching on being committed to love. And in other words, being committed to God, because the Bible says God is love. Amen. So, so when we commit ourselves to love, we, we really decided to bring a message through to our whole church to understand that love is not just an emotion, a feeling. It is not just uh, something we experience or that we feel in our hearts. Uh, love is a commitment that we have towards God. Because God said, love each other the same way I loved you. That's what Jesus said over and over again. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your whole mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God. It's, and, and Jesus said, I command you to love each other the way that I loved you. So love is not always just a feeling. I don't just love you because I feel like it. I love you because Jesus said I must. Amen. So, so, so love is a commitment. Don't think that love is not a commitment. Love is a commitment. In marriage, love is a commitment. In family, love is a commitment. Don't just love people because it feels good or it feels right. You have to love people because Jesus says you, has, you have to. Amen? So it is a command that Jesus gives us. He says, love each other. And so I can recap on all the Sundays, but if, if you haven't been here lately, you are more than welcome to go onto Facebook, go onto YouTube. You will find all the services of every Sunday you will find on Facebook and you will find it on YouTube. So you are more than welcome to go and recap. We have a lot of people all over South Africa joining in via live stream every Sunday, watching the services with us and staying up to date with us. So uh, I'm really proud of everyone always leaving comments and sending me messages saying, listen, thank you for this morning service. It touched me. So it always helps to get those responses because it helps us to know that we are reaching out and making a far greater impact than just being here at church. Amen. So it's awesome to know everybody is watching and you're joining in with us. So this morning, if you have your finger at Jeremiah 24 verse 7, many of you will be familiar uh, with the scripture and will know what the scripture says. Because in this passage, I want to I use this passage and, and start off with, with this small passage and then go into the introduction of what I want to share today. And I believe that, that God is a good God. Amen. I believe that God is faithful. And if God gives you something, it's, it's only to bless you and to bold you. Amen. Do you believe that? And the Bible says that every good and perfect gift is from a father from above. The Bible says if, if, our fathers of, if we as fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more will our heavenly father bless us? 
and know what is good for us. So I believe if, if God has a promise for you or if God has a future for you, it is very silly for us to fight against it and think that we have to now surrender our, our idea or now we have to surrender our uh, promises that we had for ourselves or we have to surrender our future or our own plans and dreams so that we can do what God wants us to do. It is silly to think that because if God wants to give you something, it will always be the ultimate base that you can have. Amen? There is nothing better than what God has for you. Let me say it again. At a young age, I had to know and I had to understand that what God has for me is better than what I had for myself. And I had to go through a process. I had to work with my heart. I had to change my heart in many ways to step into what God had for me. Because as a young boy, I grew up in church. I was filled with the Holy Spirit at a young age. I saw awesome things happen in church. I grew up in church. And I really enjoyed and I loved church. But as I grew older, things happened to my heart. I never lost my love for church, but I realized that my heart was not in the right place. Many times I would say, I don't want to really go to church today because that disappointed me and that disappointed me. But I will still have a relationship with you, Lord, but the church disappointed me. And, 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 and I had to look at my heart and I had to search my heart and find out what seed of poison have been sown in my heart for me to feel this way because the church of God is holy it is the body of Jesus it belongs to God and if anything belongs to God it is holy amen and it is perfect and, and even you that, 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 that sitting here this morning, many of you have also gone through that stage in your life, or many of you might know of someone who don't have to, um, that, that feels like they don't have to go to church, they don't really like going to church, they don't want to be part of it because they've been disappointed, or they've been hurt, or they feel that they've been failed, they might have felt they have been overlooked. And so we have a lot of people that, that we deal with, but our main goal is for the body to come together. And the reason why people don't come together is because somewhere in their hearts, something happened. And, and, and when I look at, at the scriptures, I realize that, that God is very intentional. Amen? Let's look at somebody, smile at them, say, God is intentional. God knows what he's doing. But I, I, I can promise you today that, that God is after your heart. God is after your heart. God is not after anything else. You know, your mind needs to be changed by the word of God. Your mind needs to be transformed. The way you think, your thoughts, that needs to be transformed. And God gives us the word to do that. But God wants to have your heart. See, I wrote this down. It says that the, the eyes, our eyes were meant to see and the ears are, are meant to hear. But the heart is meant to understand discern, and give insight. So our eyes are meant to see, you know, our ears are meant to hear, but the heart that you have is meant to understand and to discern. The, your, your heart is the place that is very sensitive. It, it, when somebody hurts you, they don't hurt you in your thoughts, they hurt you in your heart. When you are disappointed, you're not disappointed in your thoughts or in your mind, you are disappointed in your heart. When you are broken, you are broken in your heart. Uh, come on, you have to be with me. When you are tired, you're not tired in your mind, you are tired in your heart. Your heart is the center where God wants to work. We teach our children that Jesus now lives in your heart. It's not in your mind or in your head. We tell our children that Jesus lives in your heart. So all of us understand and know that our heart is an organ, but still spiritually we believe that your heart is the place where Jesus wants to live. He doesn't want to live in an organ. An organ is an organ. The old ancient people believe that if when they slay an animal, they have to eat the heart of the animal. Because they believed that the heart was the center and the spirit area of the animal. So when they eat the heart, then, then, then they receive that strength and that energy. Over and over, the Bible even says in, in, in the Old Testament that Abraham gave the men food to strengthen their hearts. So whenever they would eat something, it was meant to strengthen their hearts. 
That's what they believed at that time. If they would eat a meal, if somebody was sad, they would say, but what is wrong with your heart? Are, are you growing weary in your heart? Are you tired in your heart? Because your heart, they believed, the ancient people believed, it was the center, it was the core of the human, and the heart was so important because it was protected with the ribs. More than all the other organs, the heart was protected. So you have to look after your heart. You have to strengthen your heart. And they believed that when you would eat healthy, your heart would be strong to look after the rest of your body. So, 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 so God wants to always work with our hearts. I always tell people that your heart is the land where God wants to sow his seed. We know all the other parables. I can't go into that this morning. But, but we know the scripture where it says that a man came and he sowed seed. That the seed is not sown into your mind. The seed is always sown into your heart. Your heart is the farm land or the property where the seed, where the farmer comes to sow the seed. And the Bible says some of the seed fell uh, am, among a rocky soil. Some of the seed fell in, in between weeds. Some of the seed fell next to the wayside, but other seed fell on fruitful soil. So the seed that fell on the wayside, the wayside is always known as the side where the people walk on the side of the road. Have you ever seen the little roads go through a field? Nothing grows there. You can see a trail that goes right through the field. Nothing will ever grow there because every day people walk on that passage in the same little road. And because it's trampled in, it's hardened, nothing will ever grow there. So, so the Bible says that the seed that fell there, the birds came and snatched it up. Some of the seed fell in between rocky soil and it was shallow soil. So the, the seed would immediately sprout its roots but then couldn't find any depth. So the sun scorched it and it died. You all know that scripture. Some seed fell in the midst of, um, of weeds. And, and when the seed grew, the weeds also grew around it. And the Bible said that, that the weeds around it started to suffocate the seed because they didn't have enough space, they didn't get enough water, and it didn't have enough sunshine. So the weeds around the seed started to suffocate the seed, and the seed was spoiled. See, God's plan is always for the seed to grow. But the seed cannot grow if your heart is not right. If your heart is like the, the, the wayside soil, it means you have been trampled on. People have misused you. People have failed you. People have walked over you. And your heart is no longer deep and sensitive. You, you formed a shell around your heart. And, and, and nobody can come into your heart. You know, there, there's, I've seen people before, two men sitting right next to each other, other in a service. And the one man will go out of the church and say, well, this morning blessed me. I can never be the same again. But the other man will walk out of the building and say, I didn't receive anything today. The reason for this is the condition of your heart. See, if uh, I, I, can, I can put a rock in a pond and I can put a sponge in a pond. If I take the sponge out of the pond, the sponge will have, will have become one with the pond. There will be water in the sponge, and the sponge will be watery. If I press it, the water will flow out of the sponge. If I take the rock out of the pond, it will be dry on the outside. If I break it open on the inside, it will be dry. Why? Because it had a hard shell, and the water couldn't penetrate into the rock to make it soft. See, it speaks of conditions of your heart. And even in the passage where the Bible speaks of sow, a seed that is sown into your heart, the focus is not really on the seed. If the seed falls in good ground, it will grow. But what what, 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 it, what it depends on is the condition of the soil. If the soil is not okay, it doesn't matter how healthy the seed is or where the seed comes from. It all depends on the attitude and the condition of your heart. See, the very same seed that might not grow in my heart will flourish in his heart. Why? It depends on what my heart is like. And the Bible, over and over again, the, in, in the Bible, God spoke to the Israelites and said, you have hardened your hearts. You are hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. How many of you have ever seen in, in, in the Old Testament? God said, you are hard-hearted people. You have hardened your hearts. 
So God wants to speak to them, but it's as if his word that comes to him just bounces off of their hearts. It doesn't penetrate. It doesn't find any entrance. And if God's word cannot find entrance into your heart, it cannot change you. And sometimes even when it finds entrance, there's too many rocks in there. And the seed, you will receive it gladly and you will go home after the service and say, wow, that was an awesome word. But the next morning you'll forget what was preached. And the devil would come and steal it away because it had no depth. And then your heart might be full of, full of weeds and you receive the word and it grows and, 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 and it helps you and it motivates you. And you go home and you tell everyone, wow, this morning really meant a lot to me. But the next moment you look at your bank account and the weed comes up next to the seed and you, you feel despondent. You, your heart grows weary. Oh, there's not enough money in my bank account. Or, or you, you come back and somebody treats you wrong at your house and, uh, and, 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 and hurts you. And, and you hear this was said about you. And, and, and you have all these cares and worries. And the Bible clearly says that the seed that was sown in the midst of the weeds started growing. But eventually it was suffocated because there were so many weeds growing around it. And the Bible says that these weeds are cares and worries of this world. So the word started growing. That is wonderful. You know, I have a garden at home. And there's nothing that, that blesses me more when I wake up in the morning and walk in the garden and I see, hey, the seed that I planted started growing. The seed that I planted started to break out of the ground. I can start seeing something green above the ground. And, and, and the next thing is, now I'm waiting for the fruit. Now I'm waiting for the water lemon, a melon. Water lemon, water melon. <laughs> now I'm waiting for the cucumbers. Now I'm waiting for the seed um, to turn into fruit. And that because that is the process that God has for the seed. But you see, the plan of the, the evil one, the devil, is not to allow any seed to fall into your heart. He is the bird that wants to snatch it away. He is the one that makes your heart hard, makes it rocky. He's the one that, that causes your heart to become like the wayside where nothing can grow. He's the one doing all of this, trying to steal the seed of God out of your heart. See, the reason why he's called a thief is, 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 is not just because he always wants to steal what you have. He wants to steal what God wants to give you. See, he doesn't have to steal what you have if he can steal it before you even get it. You have to understand the scripture. It doesn't have to steal anything from you if he can keep you from getting it. So his goal is to always harden your heart, make your heart bitter, make you sad, feel disappointed, never feel good enough. If he can do that, then he knows that even when you come to church and you hear an awesome message that can set you free for the rest of your life, it will not find entrance to change you. See, only if God's word can find entrance into your heart. And if you have protected your heart, and that's why I love praise and worship. When you praise and worship God, that is the, that is the time we need to prepare your heart. I always tell the band, guys, when you praise and worship on the stage, and when you lead everyone into praise and worship, that is when God wants to work with people's hearts. And when he works with their hearts in the praise and worship, he's preparing their hearts to receive the seed that I want to sow into their hearts for that morning. So praise and worship is not just something we do before we start with the word. Praise and worship is the preparation for your heart to receive what God wants to give you this morning through the message. So you have to look after your heart. You have to protect your heart and make sure that there's no rocks in your heart. And, 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 and what a farmer will do before he sows his seed is he will also prepare the ground. He will take a plow he will, he will get manure. He will do whatever he can to make the fruit as productive as possible, as fruitful as possible. And he will take machines and plows and, and he will plow through it. They remove all the rocks, remove all the weeds. He'll put manure in. He will do whatever, whatever he can to make sure that when the seed comes, the soil is ready. So when you come to church, you have to be sure that before you receive the word, 
that your heart is ready to receive it. If your heart is not ready, you're wasting your time. And it might seem hard today, but let me say it again. God is interested in your heart. God wants to work with your heart. God wants to deposit something into your heart. He wants to look after your heart. And Jesus spoke a lot about our hearts, but Jeremiah 24 verse 7 shares this passage. That God was upset with the Israelites. Over and over again, he said that you have hardened your hearts. You are hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. And the next moment, you hear what the Bible says, and I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, and they will return to me with their whole heart. The Bible also says that, that God speaks to the people, and He gives them a promise. He says, I will take out the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. A fleshly heart is a soft heart. It is a sensitive heart. It can feel, it can understand, it can distinguish, like we said earlier. It can discern, and it can understand. A hardened heart, a rocky heart, cannot understand. It cannot discern, it cannot believe, it cannot trust. And when our hearts become like that, we push people away. We push people away. Why do we do that? Because we don't want to get hurt again. That's why we do it. And in the process of pushing people away, isolating ourselves, protecting ourselves, we are hardening our hearts every day, every moment, every second. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. I've hardened my heart. But the sad thing is that when we harden our hearts towards people, our hearts become hard. Like I said earlier. And even when I go to church, I struggle to worship. And I think my, my hurt is not towards God. Or my disappointment is not towards God. It's towards someone. But because I have hardened my heart towards someone to protect myself, my relationship with Jesus is not the way it's supposed to be. And, and it's like, I don't know why I'm struggling to worship today. It's because you hardened your heart. But Lord, I didn't harden my heart towards you. I'm, I'm protecting myself from someone. And God says, no, even when you do that, your heart is still hard. Maybe not towards me, but it's still hard. And I'm still struggling to get through to you. And so, 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 so God said, I have a goal. What I will do is I will take out the heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. So God says, I'm going to give you a second chance. You've hardened your heart, but let me give you a new heart. See, so many times we think that we will understand God and know God through our minds. And, and that's where the devil lies to us because he says, you can figure God out. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do. Is God trying to keep something from us? Well, the devil said or the snake said, we will be like him. So why is God trying to keep something from us? Instead of just loving God with their hearts, they started to doubt God in their minds. And when they doubted God in their minds, they've wronged their hearts. And the heart and the hearts. And here we see in this passage that God is intended, or in, intends to look after our hearts. God says, and even when your heart becomes corrupted or hardened, I want to take out that heart. It doesn't say I want to upgrade it or fix it. He says, I want to remove it. See, a hardened heart can't always be fixed. A hardened heart needs to be removed. And then he says, I will give you a heart to know me, a heart of flesh. So, so, so God gives us a heart to know him. So how do we know God? How do we love God? Not with my mind, not with my eyes, my ears. I love God with my heart. So what we need to understand today is that our hearts are very important towards God. And it's essential for us as well to look after our hearts. To protect our hearts. It, it, it is so important. The Bible says that we need to love God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 to 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your hearts. With all your heart. Not part of your heart. With all your heart. Your whole heart. You need to love God. The Bible says 
and, and, and tells us as well that what the heart is full of, the mouth speaketh. The same way Jesus says the way you will know a tree is by the fruit that it bears. So have you, have you ever tried to, to get through to someone because you see something's wrong? And you can see they are contained. They are keeping their pose. <laughs> they, are, they are saying what's right because they force themselves not to say what is in the heart. Until you pinch a nerve. Until you pinch a nerve. And the next moment, everything that's in the heart flows out of the mouth. And then many times they say, oh man, I shouldn't have said that. And I say, no, I'm glad you did. Because now I know what's in your heart. Why did we have to get here to know what's in your heart? Why didn't you come and speak about what's in your heart? Why did we first have to go through this process of hurt and pain and anger? You know, I do a lot of counseling. And I've said, why did it have to take this long to know what's in your heart? Because what the heart is full of, the mouth speaketh. So, so, so what we need to understand is what I always tell couples when I do counseling or when I speak one-on-one -on -one with people, I always tell them, it's very important to look after your heart. You've been harboring these thoughts and these feelings in your heart for a long time. That's why you've been struggling for a long time. That's why you have been depressed for a long time. Because your heart is sick with everything that you are holding in in your heart. Everybody that knows me knows that I like to talk. I like, if I feel something in my heart, you'll see it on my face. And I'll pull you aside and say, listen, this is how I feel. Do I, am I right or am I wrong? Please tell me. No, you're wrong. I didn't mean it that way. Okay, okay thank you so much. Now I can remove this out of my heart. See, if we don't talk about things, we harbor it in our hearts. It's time to cut that boat loose. Let it go. Don't harbor the wrong things in your heart. And the only way you get it out is when you communicate, is when you speak, because what the heart is full of, the mouth speaker. I've been in conversations before, and people speak about things the whole time, and I feel so out of place, and I think, why do you speak about this the whole time? Your heart is so full of this. You are consumed with this. Let's talk about something else. Have you, anyone else ever felt that way when you're in a conversation? You think, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I don't want to speak about other people anymore. Let's speak about something different. What the heart is full of, the mouth speaketh. That is how the Lord intended it to be. And then many times when that happens, you know what's happening or what's taking place in someone's heart. Then you tell them, listen, have you dealt with that in your life before? Because that's all you speak about. Have, have you fixed this? This might be rocky soil in your heart. This might be a wayside path in your heart. This might be weeds that's robbing you from what God has for you. God gave you an awesome word last Sunday. Why are you now doubting it? God gave you an awesome prophetic word a year ago. Why do you now think it's not going to happen? Come on, is anybody with me this morning? Are you with me? Amen? So, so we have to understand that, that, that God wants to look after our hearts. And many of you might think, you're more, you know, we are preaching on committed to love. Why are you preaching about our hearts? <laughs> I will prove it to you just now. Quickly go to Psalm 63, verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1. So people that know me personally knows that I'm someone who likes to talk about how I feel in my heart. I don't always like to say or speak my mind. I will reserve myself. But if I feel something in my heart, I'll give you a call. And I'll say, hey, listen, this is how I feel in my heart. Am I right? Am I wrong? If I'm right, then let's talk it out. Let's, let's work through this. I always tell couples that you never have to fight if you can talk about something. If you can talk about it, you don't have to fight about it. Amen? If I can communicate, you don't have to guess what is in my heart. I can tell you what's in my heart because I trust you with my heart. See, when you marry someone or when you step into marriage, I always tell them that 
that basically you are now removing your heart and putting it in their hands, saying, now I'm trusting you with my heart. See, it's a big step to tell someone that you love them, that you want to be with them forever, because with that, the idea comes that there might be failure. That's why everybody is scared to say, I love you, because you might not hear it back. But when you hear it back, you think, okay, we're a match. We're going to get married because you love me, I love you. You know, let's do this. Let's get married. Let's have a family. I will never leave you. You will never leave me. But it's, it's a condition of the heart. It's a sensitive area in the heart to give your heart to someone and trust him with it. But God is after your heart. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly will I seek you. My inner self thirsts for you. My flesh longs and faints for you in a dry and weary land where, so, where no water is. In other translations, it says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, my heart seeks for you. My heart longs for you. What is your heart longing for when you are sitting here today in the service? What is your heart longing for? What is your heart thirsting for? The Bible says every time David sinned, he was called the man after God's heart. So even God has a heart. Come on, did anybody get that right now? Even God has a heart in the same way I have a heart. Not my organ, the heart that pumps blood through my veins, but I also have a heart. The heart is the center of a human being. It is a place where God works with. It is where God speaks mysteries into. It is the place where I, where I hear with my ears, but when I, then I listen with my heart. See, there's a difference. The Bible says, um, let every ear who hear, amen, let every eye see, let every heart understand. But the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that God over and over again spoke with the people, but they hardened their hearts. Hebrews 5, 4, 3, it speaks about your heart. It says, do not be like your forefathers who hardened their hearts in the desert. But today when you hear, it says you hear with your hearts. You don't hear the gospel with your mind, you hear it with your heart heart and you receive Jesus into your heart God is after your heart what does your heart look like today is your heart healthy to accommodate what God has for you see even Jesus speaks to the people and he says that the heart is deceitful above all else and then we think but well, what a, a person's heart how can a person's heart be deceitful how can my heart be corrupted? And yet, even in 2 Thessalonians, Jesus speaks and, 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 and through messages to Paul, and Paul speaks to the church, and Paul says, let your hearts be cleansed by having faith in Jesus. So our hearts can be evil. Our hearts can be misleading. And that is why we need God to give us a new heart when our hearts have been come, become corrupted. That's what the Bible says, that when we have faith in Jesus, He cleanses our hearts through faith. He cleanses our hearts through the washing of His Word. And it cleanses our hearts. God is after your heart. Quickly turn to Ephesians 3 verse 17. Ephesians 3 verse 17. So the Bible speaks in 2 Thessalonians and it tells us that God wants to cleanse our hearts through faith. By believing in Him, trusting in Him, and knowing that He will not fail, my heart is constantly being cleansed. Because I believe, I believe. The song we sang, I believe, I believe. Have you ever felt that way when troubles come your way and, and you feel sad and you, you feel weak and your heart is aching? How many have ever felt that? How can a heart ache? Have any, anyone here have ever had heartache? 
Do you know what I'm talking about right now? It's when you feel in your spirit, in your heart, you experience a heartache. That's what I believe what Paul said, that my, 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 my whole, in, in my body, I'm going through birth spasms for Christ to be formed in you. I believe in his heart, in his spirit, in his womb, his heart area, he had, he had a heartache for Christ to be formed in the Galatians, the Romans. He had a heartache. His heart was troubled. And, and so there's so many scriptures we can look at. Oh, my heart, why are you downcast within me? How David wrote, my heart, why are you downcast? David was a man after God's own heart. How am I after God's heart? My heart is longing for you. Like a deer panteth for water, so my soul, so my heart is longing for you. See, your heart needs to long for God. Your heart needs to cry out to God. It is with my whole heart that I love God, that I serve God. See, many of us have never even thought about it because we're always troubled in our hearts. So your heart is the birthplace for your thoughts. Your heart is the land where God wants to sow seed. Your heart is the place where God gives you a prophetic word. That is where you receive the word of God. That's where this, the, the word of God grows in you and bears fruit. Your heart is the place where you become fruitful. And when you become fruitful, you speak of the things. Your, your, your words is the fruit of what God planted in your heart. I always tell young men that I speak to or people that want to preach, I always tell them, you cannot preach something that is not in your heart. Don't ever go and stand on a stage and share a scripture if it's not dead in your heart. Let it first be in your heart and then you can speak about it. See, sometimes we have to go through things. We have to understand the scripture. We have to go through a little bit of life before something is planted in your heart. See, you can see when somebody testifies and when they share a testimony of how God touched their lives, you can see that it's truly in their hearts and that the Lord touched their hearts and changed their hearts. And so here Ephesians 2, verse, uh, sorry, Ephesians 3, verse 17 says, May Christ, through your faith, dwell and make his permanent home in your heart. Hearts, say that loud, hearts, make his permanent home in your hearts, okay? And then it says that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love, what, which is the breadth, the length, the height, and the, the depth of it, that you may really come to know and experience for yourselves. Who wants to know and experience for yourself right here today? You don't just want to hear it from me. You want to know or you want to experience it for yourself. Amen? If I've told you how God saved me and how he blessed me and how he healed me, if you hear me say that, then you must have a desire in your heart to say, but I want to feel that as well. Amen? I also want to feel that joy. I want to, I want to feel that touch. See, then it, here Paul says, so that you may know and experience it for yourself. The love of Christ. So, so Paul says here that you may come to know and experience, which is the height, the depth, the length, the width of a love of Jesus that is inside of you, in your hearts. <laughs> see, many of you might have thought, but why is he speaking about our hearts? Do you see the connection? Jesus says that his love, that surpasses understanding, that surpasses knowledge, is in your heart. What the heart is full of, the mouth speaketh. And it says, the love of Christ, that you may be filled through all your being unto the fullness of God. That you may have the richest measure of the divine presence 
and, and become a body totally filled and flooded with God himself. So here Paul explains to us that there is an area in you. There is a space within you that God wants to fill with himself. God wants to flood that area in your life with who he is. But if something else occupies that space and that area, God says, I cannot fill that area. That is why John says, if you have love for the world and have love for God, then it says, then the love of God is not in you. Uh, come on, because your heart is filled with the love for everything else. Your love is filled with the love for the things of the world. And God says, I will not share the space that I have put in you, that I have created within you, with anything else. That's why the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> money is not bad, but if you love it more than God, God says, I cannot be in you. Then God says, then I cannot pour my love into your heart because something else is occupying the space. If something is full, I cannot fill it with something else. I first have to remove what is in there so that I can fill it with something else. The Bible clearly says that if you say you love God but hate your brother, then the Bible says then you are a liar and the love of God is not in you. So God has to first take out all the hate that is in you. Come on, how many of you are understanding this this morning? Are you getting this? See, your heart is the space. Your heart is the height, the length, the depth, the width that God has created and has put within you so that he can fill it. That is your heart. And clearly here he says that nothing else can take that space. The tenant that is occupying that space needs to go, needs to leave, because God's love needs to be in there. And here Paul explains to everyone and say that Christ might, might, might dwell in your hearts through faith, so that you can come to understand what awesome love he has for you. Let's just read it again. That you may really come, verse 19, that you may really come. Let's, let's all say it together. That you may really, really. There's a reason why I say it's really. That you may really come to know through experience for yourselves the love of Christ which far surpasses knowledge that you may be filled through all your being unto the fullness, that you may have the richest treasure of the divine presence and become a body totally filled and flooded with God. And when I understand, and when I look at this passage, I realize that, that, that God has put the space in you and he has left it up to you. He said, I'm giving you the foundation. You can choose what you're going to build with. I'm giving you this empty space in your heart that I have put there when you have received Jesus. And this space that is in you, I want to fill with my love. Will you allow me to? But I cannot do it if you love the world more than me. I cannot do it if you love money more than me. I cannot do it if you hate others. Because you cannot love someone and hate others at the same time. Then it means you do not know my kind of love. See, a worldly kind of love accepts that you hate some and love others. God says, that is not my love. And I cannot fill you with that kind of love if you have the wrong idea about love. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. It's a different kind of love. 
that we have spoken out late, spoken about lately. I need you to turn to Matthew six, and I'm going to close Matthew six twenty one. Matthew six twenty one. You're in Matthew six twenty one. The Bible tells us and gives us instructions of how we can look after our hearts. Now, earlier I said to everyone, the, the, the way you, you, you protect your heart is that when you feel something wrong in your heart, because everyone is listening to me right now will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you feel something wrong in your heart, you feel something wrong in your heart towards someone or towards something, even towards yourself, you feel something wrong, something that should not be there, the only way you get it out is when you speak. Let me say it again. The only way you get something out of your heart that you feel should not be there is when you speak about it. If you keep it in, it becomes worse and worse and worse and worse. It's like septicemia. If you don't drain it out of your body, it starts to infect your whole body. You have to get it out. You have to let what is in out. The only way we get our hearts clean is when we speak about what is in our hearts. See, I have sat with grown men, fully grown men, 60, 70, 70 years old, and they will cry like a baby when we have counseling. Because somehow the Holy Spirit showed me and said that this man never dealt with the pain that his father caused him. He never spoke about it. He kept it in. And nobody could ever understand him because he was hard. He was strict. He was always angry, upset. He had an alcohol problem because he never knew how to deal what was in here. Because no one told him that the way you deal with it is to speak about it and give it to Jesus. He was 70 years old, and for the first time, he prayed with me, and he forgave what his father did to him. And he turned around as a human being. He became a new person. Suddenly, he became loving, caring. He became a person no one ever expected him to be. See, the love of Jesus changes your heart. It changes who you are. You can never be the same again. And that touched me and that showed me and that scared me to ever again keep something in my heart. See, that man kept it in his heart for more than 60 years. The disappointment, the failure, that always lived in his heart. And he never got rid of it. It ruined his marriage. It ruined his relationship with his family, his children, because he never dealt with what was in his heart. That's why I said that morning, it scared me to ever again keep something in my heart. Sometimes I think I'm irritating, but I'm sorry. I'm not going to let something live in my heart that's not supposed to be there. I'd rather give you a call. I'd rather go and speak. I'd rather have a family meeting at home around the table, but I'll have a meeting. I'm getting it out somehow, but I'm getting rid of it. I don't want anything to occupy any space in my heart that the love of Jesus can occupy. I'm not going to let anything steal space in my heart what the love of Jesus can occupy. The Matthew 6, 21 tells us, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also someone had to say amen or hallelujah right now <laughs> for where your treasure is there will your heart be also and i felt i wanted to close with this scripture today and i wanted to ask everyone what is your treasure because in this passage Jesus speaks to the people and he says earlier, he says, 19, do not gather and heap up and store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust 
and worm consume and destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But gather and heap up and store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor worm, nor worm consume and destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So here Jesus speaks to everyone. He says, do not store up treasures on this earth because if you have earthly treasures, your heart will also be on this earth. And God says, I don't want you to share your heart with the earth. I want your heart in heaven where I am. I want you to love the things I love. I want you to love me. And here he says, let your heart have treasures in heaven so that your heart can belong to heaven. Because on this earth, if you have treasures here, it might be stolen, it might be corrupted. And when that happens, your heart will be hurt. Come on, do you understand this scripture? Many of us just understand it in, 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 a, in a very easy and simple way, but it's deep. The scripture says that when you trust me with your heart, with the heavenly things, you will never be disappointed because on this earth it will be stolen. Worm can eat it up. Moth can destroy it. Rust can destroy it. And when that happens, your heart will be broken because your heart loves the things of the earth. And God says, rather let your heart love the things of heaven and then I promise you, you will never be disappointed because no worm can steal it there. No thief can break into heaven, steal it there. No rust is in heaven. Amen? Come on. No moth is in heaven. Nothing can steal it because if your treasure is in heaven, it's protected. If your treasure is in heaven, I will look after your heart. And I'll protect your heart. I want to share this one last passage with you. Let's all stand together this morning. Let's all stand together. Here it says, A wise man's heart guides his mouth. Most important, the mouth confesses what the heart trusts. Let me say it again. The mouth confesses what the heart trusts. This so touched me and it reminded me of one of our conferences. And I've shared this before, but there's many people standing here today who've never heard it before. But I've, I went to a conference and, and Dr. Darius Daniels was speaking. And the next moment, I thought he was preaching to me. Okay, I was sitting there and he, was, he shared a story with us. And I want to share it with you today, just real quick while we're standing. He spoke and he said once he was sitting with his dad at the table. And as they were sitting at the table, he looked at his dad and he said, Dad, when are you going to fix your finger? Because his little finger broke once when they played basketball. And he broke his finger and he never went to the doctor to get it fixed. So he thought he's just going to wrap it up and leave it and then it will, it will connect again and the bones will be healed and his finger will be okay. But... After a couple of months, when he took the bandages off, when he would lift up his finger, it would be skew like this. And, and, and Dr. Darius Daniels sat there at the table and said, Dad, are you going to leave your finger that way? And his dad said, Son, I'm, I'm not ready to go through that pain because the doctor said, when I go back to him, he will have to break my finger again. And then it will be able to connect. And then it will be okay again. Come on, you have to stay with me right now. It's very important. So the dad, and he said, Dad, are you serious? And he said, yes, I'm, I'm too scared to go and, and break my finger again. It's going to hurt a lot. It might be okay afterwards, but I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to go through it. I still have 60% of the use of my finger, and I'm okay with that. And Dr. Darius sat there and said, Dad, you only have 60% of the usage of your finger. How can you be okay with that? Just go through the pain. 
Just go through it. Face it. Come on, face it. Go to the doctor. Let him break it again. But let it heal correctly so that you can have 100% use of your little finger. And as we were sitting there, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I thought it was just me. But I sat there on that chair crying like a baby, trying to cover my face so that no one will see. The next moment when I turned to my left, I saw Prophet Joey Zamora, <laughs> Meredith Zamora, <laughs> Pastor Jeffrey Smith, all of our pastors crying like babies. I thought it was just me. <laughs> Prophet Joey was <laughs> crying like this of his face in the air, crying like a baby, and he went down. And the next moment he said, God wants to heal your hearts. How many of you feel you are not running at full potential? How many of you feel your hearts have been broken and every day you are functioning at 60%, 70% of um, your, your, your functionality and you're not really running the race fully. You're just running at 70% because you have been disappointed. Your hearts have been broken and you are too scared to go to the doctor and face what have healed wrong. You are too scared to bring out of your heart that which have healed wrong to go and fix it once again so that you can have 100% use of your emotions, your heart. You can love again 100%. You can love without holding back. You can love someone without being scared. And God spoke to me and said, Jamon, you've been hurt in your life. And for years now, you've, you've felt like you are not running at 100%. You are only functioning at 60%, 70%. The next moment the Holy Spirit spoke to me and that, that message spoke to my heart. I started crying. I said, Jesus, that's true. Jesus, please forgive me. Take out this heart of stone. Give me a heart of flesh again. Give me a heart. Let, heal my heart. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go through the hurt to let this pour out. I'm ready to go to the doctor. Let him break my finger again so that I can heal it 100%. I want to be a 100% dad. I want to be a 100% husband to my wife. Even if I've been hurt. But I'm willing to break this finger again so that I can use 100%. Come on, I don't want to get emotional this morning, but there's a lot of people sitting here and standing here in this building and you are not functioning at 100%. I've seen you walk through this door. I've given many of you a call during the week. I speak to many of you. My area leaders come back to me every now and again, say, pray for this family. They're going through a hard time. Pray for this person. You are not functioning at 100% because you healed wrong. Don't wrap it up and let it heal wrong. This morning, I want to create an opportunity that they where you are right now to close your eyes. And I want to ask you right now, as we're standing here, and as we're closing, and as we are moving into baptism, I want you to close your eyes and say, Jesus, I'm not running at 100%. Jesus, I healed wrong. Because I kept it in. Because I wrapped it up. And I didn't come to you to pour out my heart, to pour out what is in me so that you can heal me 100%. And if you are here this morning and you say, yeah, Mon, that's me. I've, I've, I've kept things inside that I never dealt with. God says, today is the day. Come on, pour it out. There where you are. Come on, right now, pour out what you are holding in. Pour out what is in your heart so that God can fill it with his love. Come and remove what is occupying your heart today so that Jesus can fill it with his tremendous love that is above comprehension, that is above understanding. 